Well, we made it, and the uh, presentation's working for now. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is a project of mine that I care so much about. I really feel like this is the most important topic of our time. I feel like even if I fail doing this project, it would have been worth it because it's just so important. Um, so the presentation I have today is called Self-Sovereign Identity. Who cares? Why now? And what can it do for me? And I hope to answer each of those questions for you sitting in the audience listening to this presentation tonight. But first, I want to tell you a story of how I got here, who I am, what the heck am I, am I doing here standing on stage talking about self-sovereign identity. So I was uh, going to college, going to university in the United States, and I was selling real estate at the time. Um, at my school, Northeastern University, you would go and you'd go to school for six months and then you'd go to a job for six months. And my first job, I was a lawyer. I, for years, wanted to be a lawyer. You see those cool lawyers on TV in America defending the bad guy and, you know, arguing back and forth in the, in the courtroom. I found out very quickly that that's not what lawyers do at all. And uh, I, I didn't want to do that. So um, my second co-op, I... Uh, was selling real estate. So I was a real estate broker in, in Boston, Massachusetts, licensed and, and, and bonded. And uh, right when I was selling that real estate was around 2008, which timeline-wise was right when the subprime mortgage collapse happened and uh, all of the banks failed uh, in some ways and uh, the housing market just went to zero. So I thought, okay, great. Um, I've done two career choices now, neither of them panned out, at least I'm still in university. So I was uh, thinking to myself, what is my skill set? What am I good at? Well, I don't really know how to do much. I'm an untrained college student. I know how to file paperwork with the state of Massachusetts, though. That counts for something. Um, so I went from being a property agent to being a company agent. So I would set up LLCs and corporations for other people in my school, work with lawyers. Um, we call ourselves the Oompa Loompas of the financial world. Um, there's a lot of corporate secretaries in the Netherlands. It's actually a very popular business here. So that's what I was doing. I was a corporate secretary, and I was collecting documents and data on people, and I graduated from university. I had this business I could go anywhere uh, I wanted. So I moved uh, to Southeast Asia. I was living in Singapore, and really learning more about uh, technology. I joined a couple different tech startups, and something stuck with me from my work as a, as a corporate secretary was that it was always very painful to collect the documents and data and go through something called KYC. So that was the big uh, aha moment for me was, wow, this is really, really painful. If we could come up with software to fix this, then um, that could make a lot of people's lives better. So that started me down the path of a company called KYC Chain. We started that in 2013. So it's a little bit early, maybe a little bit too early in the blockchain space. Um, and we were trying to solve problems for enterprises to make their KYC onboarding a little bit easier. But what we found, and the aha moment from, from that business was that banks and other large organizations fundamentally see themselves as owning your data and your identity. And uh, no matter how hard we tried to create, you know, kind of this benefit to the user, the organization only wanted the benefit from themselves and didn't really want to return much of that value. So that's when we decided that we had to do a business to consumer wallet, that it should be open source, and that it should be used to store the identity so that you could go through a process much more easily. So um, that's what sort of led me, or my backstory, to me here today. And that, that's a preamble to this question, self-sovereign identity, who cares? Um, so if you could see the top of the slide, which you can, um, it says, who cares? Um, and I think that uh, the Netherlands is an interesting place for who cares, because there's all these different startups that are all in the fintech ecosystem. So you've got capital startups, you've got um, companies who are focused on different elements of uh, business, right? And, and you've got a lot of companies that are focused on, on finance and financial technologies. And each of these companies has to go through an independent KYC process with all of their customers. And you as a customer have to go through a different KYC process every time you want to sign up for a bank. You've got to walk into the bank, you have to present your ID card, you've got to present your proof of uh, address and your utility bill. This is a very annoying, redundant process, and the bank's asking you for all this information that you've previously and sometimes already given them. Um, so, so that's kind of the question, who cares? It's the businesses on one side and the consumers on the other side. And so what is it? What is self-sovereign identity? Well, there's a, a really good blog post written a few years ago called the uh, 10 Principles of Self-Sovereign Identity, and in it, the, the uh, architect of W3C and, and TLS, the top level secure of the internet, Christopher Allen, um, posits that these 10 points are really important 
for identity. So first and foremost, it should be portable. You should be able to transport this identity onto different systems. It shouldn't only be a Facebook identity, it should be an identity that goes to different systems. Uh, it should be interoperable and, and be able to uh, use in different systems. And you should have to give consent, right? GDPR is very important for this as well. It should be persistent. You should have access to your own data. You should have control over it. And really, I think the most important one is that there's an independent existence, right? So that what self-sovereign identity means is that you walk up to the system with a key and someone attests to that. It's not someone hands you the key and now you have one. It, it's kind of you're, you're an independent person, right? So um, a lot of people in the room might be Dutch citizens. The only person qualified to say that you're a Dutch citizen would be the Dutch government. But you're a person whether you're Dutch or not. There may be a day someday that you renounce your Dutch citizenship. You're no longer Dutch, but you're still a person. Right, so there's, there's a fundamental difference between the two. And in a self-sovereign identity system, you kind of have that inherent right from the outset. And someone says something about you, but you maintain that identity. This will become, I think, a bit more clear as we get into the details more about what it is. Um, here's another a graph which kind of illustrates what this might look like. In a, in a centralized identity system, you have to go and you have to sign up to all these different websites. And when you do, websites, governments, bank, um, you're always providing the same information about yourself, but you have to do it over and over again. And you're never able to really collect that much data that you own. It's the company that owns this data about you, and they're probably harvesting it and using it for, for different purposes. Um, we were upstairs talking about this beforehand, and there was a really interesting quote which my colleague said, which says, when you go to check your car in at uh, you know, a parking lot, the company takes custody of the car, but they don't really use the car. When you go and you put your data in Facebook, Facebook uses that data and makes money off of that data, right? And as we move into this digital world where these digital identities become really, really important and our data becomes really valuable, the question of who owns and who's controlling this data is, becomes a really important issue. Um, and in a self-sovereign identity system, you control that data and choose what different apps have access to it. And we think that this is really the way the world is meant to work and we're, we're hoping that we can affect that change. Um, so why now? Um, if you look at the statistics about data hacks, these are specific to data identity. This is not just data of any kind, this is data about your identity. There's been not 10 billion records essentially lost since 2013. So just in the five, last five years, 10 billion points of data, and every day 5 million records are lost. That's uh, 58 records um, every second. So in the time it took me to say that sentence, there were like hundreds of pieces of identity which were stolen, which is crazy, right? I mean, this is like a big problem. So these companies are asking for all this data. They're really bad at keeping it safe, and they're also profiting off of it. So like, what the heck? Like, where does this end? Uh, Cambridge Analytica, the Facebook scandal, that was a very recent one. Equifax, the company that's supposed to be only doing the thing that they failed at, which is keeping your data and keeping it safe. They obviously aren't very good as a business. And uh, Uber um, also had 20 million people impacted. I don't know why I picked on Uber, but Anyway, uh, big company, so we'll put them up there. Okay, so why now? Another important question for answer for why now is the GDPR. So GDPR is the General Data Privacy Rule. Uh, European legislators, in my opinion, got it really, really right. They impose some stiff penalties on companies who lose your data. So now Uber or Facebook or Equifax loses European citizen data, they can get fined 4% of their global revenue. Imagine what that is for a company like HSBC. That's like a death keel. That's like end of the company. It's like no longer existing if you lose 4% of your global revenue, potentially, right, potentially. Um, and this turns, basically, the turning data in from an asset to a liability for some of these companies. And it impacts all companies, not just European companies. If you have European citizen data in your servers, no matter where you are in the world, you're subject to GDPR compliance which is really cool. So that's why I think why now. And there's also another piece of legislation which isn't as well known called PSD2. And this is, has a lot of stuff to do with payments. We don't need to get into the details, but it, it forces banks and payment companies to provide you with your data back to you. So if you give a company your data, you can ask for it back. You can request for it to be deleted. So these are really important legislative changes. So um, one more uh, reason why now that I think is really interesting uh, this is one that people don't, don't think about probably as much as the Common Reporting Standard and AEOI. So this is the Automatic Exchange of Information. It's a, it's a tax compliance um, ordinance that's been passed basically all around the world. Hundreds of different countries have all agreed to share 
any customer data about having a bank account in XYZ country. So now if you're a Dutch citizen, but you have a bank account in, uh, I don't know, Monaco, you think you're being slick, probably not a great idea to uh, keep that quiet anymore because they're gonna share that information. Um, and it's really, really kind of difficult to even see what's being shared, how it's being shared. Um, if you do change your residency, how do you even do that? It's quite difficult. So if you're a Dutch citizen, um, but you go abroad, you no longer live in uh, the Netherlands anymore, you have to come up with a new tax residency and you have to report that to your government. You have to make that very clear, otherwise you still have to pay tax in the Netherlands and uh, get that wrong, you could have a, a big tax bill. So um, I think about this stuff a lot because I deal with companies and residencies and anyway, that's, that's kind of the world that I'm coming from. So what can it do for you? That's uh, my opportunity to tell you what specifically I'm doing as a company to try to give you value with a self-sovereign identity. I don't think that anybody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I'd really like a self-sovereign identity today. Like nobody's ever done that in the history of the world. It's never happened. A lot of people have said I want you know, a plane ticket or I want to open up a bank account or I want to open up a company. Those are transactions which require a piece of identity. And so what we're trying to do is come up with a marketplace of uh, useful products and services that rely upon your identity. So we call our, our system self-key. Um, I think it's a clever name. I came up with it because that was a long story, but um, the, <laughs> yeah, it was initially called Five Selfie and it just didn't make any sense. So self-key was a name that kind of stuck with us. And uh, self-key is a blockchain-based identity system that allows you to instantly and securely access different products and services. And we're focused on these inherently international products and services where it's really, really challenging and difficult to prove that you are who you say you are um, in these cases. Or instances where you may not want to share your identity uh, very willingly, such as a token sale, but it's still important that you share something about yourself. Um, so here's some of our partners. This is kind of the, uh, the credibility slide where you should listen to me because other companies trust me and uh, therefore you can trust me too. Um, here are the companies that uh, we are working with so far. A couple of banks, uh, Standard Chartered Bank was really instrumental in helping build out the first volume of our system. Um, here's our team, even though the top of it's cut off. Um, this says growth, so these are kind of the people who are working on marketing, and these are design and developers. These are people who work on the, the technical stuff and are generally smarter than the people on this side of the screen. Um, <laughs> legal and compliance, we have a lot of lawyers. Whenever you do anything in blockchain or personal data or privacy, or, uh, do an ICO as we did. Um, it's very important to hire a legal team. Um, one of the best things that we did is we paid our legal team in tokens. So they weren't incentivized to build up a bunch of hours, they were incentivized to see the project be successful. And I think that was the first time in uh, history that I've managed to do that. Um, we literally paid our lawyers with our tokens, key tokens, which I think I, I'm very proud of. Um, so here's how it works. So enough of the mumbo jumbo, what does it mean to me? It means that it's an application that runs in your phone, you store your, your documents and your data, you store your passport, you store a, a copy of your passport or a copy of your utility bill, and you can get that notarized or certified by a notary or a translator in the system, and then you can use that to sign up for different products and services. And how does this bank know that this document that you shared has already been shared with this notary and has been shared with this other bank? Well, that's the hash in the blockchain, and that element of of uh, anchoring something to the blockchain is actually very unique and we think a, a public ledger is really good and, and suitable for it. Um, so what the self-key kind of concept is, is a non-profit foundation. It's a technology stack which is free and open source and it's a wallet and it's a marketplace. So you, you keep your data in the wallet and then you can access different products and services through the marketplace. And that's it, very simple. And the only thing which is, makes it a little bit more interesting is that it runs off this token called key. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is use self-key technology to make identity transactions faster, hassle-free, more private, and more secure. And uh, here's a quote from the Standard Chartered Group Global CIO talking about our work together and kind of like what this could mean for the future, right? So if we're actually successful, what does this mean? Right now, if you want to go and you want to get on a plane, you want to buy a plane ticket, you want to get an Uber, there's like five different identity transactions and they're all kind of annoying to have to do. You've got to stand in line at the airport, you've got to show your passport, and the guy that's at the queue that's seen 100 different people today kind of looks at your passport and looks at you and asks you some invasive questions, and then he lets you through. Or he doesn't, and that's a worse situation. But it's just very, it's a, it's a friction process right now. So it could be seamless, right? If you were able to get a self-sovereign identity that enabled 
uh, passport control to actually see your data. They can say, okay, this person's traveled to these different countries, this biometric, biometric data matches, and it's just a machine that lets you through rather than a person kind of discerning, you know, I don't really like what you look like. I'm gonna ask you to go to secondary, right? Which is what they have the power to do now. Okay, so moving on, what is this key token and what is this all about and what does this do? So what we're trying to do with this key token is mimic the real world as much as possible, but just make it electronic. Because all of our identity documents and data are now paper driven, they can be lost, they're really difficult to interact with in a digital environment. So we're just trying to make it electronic. So let's take the example of a, of a certifier, right? So all of these parties on the network have to stake a certain amount of key. And for a certifier, this works the same way in the real world. So um, I'm a notary, I have to pay a certain amount to the government, and then I'm free to be a notary in the system. That's all that we do is we just require the notary to stake a certain amount of key, and then we, we try to interact in the system in an electronic way. So I walk up to the notary, I give him my identity documents, and then he gives me back a claim about my identity. So it's basically a signed identity proof, and then I can use that signed identity proof to onboard out of bank. So this is something that we've done, it's been proven, does work, and it's completely electronic and within the, the self-key ecosystem. So this key is designed to make these parties act in a way that's in the best interest of the system. So if this notary is giving out false identity proofs, then he'll lose that amount that he staked, and that will provide a disincentive for him to act in a way that's uh, untoward the network. So if that last screen was, was uh, confusing, try to just simplify it in five easy steps, right? You first download the wallet and create your ID, yeah, verify the identity by uploading the identity document. Then you can browse in the marketplace and pick a product, and then you can complete the application. That's it, very simple. So here's what it looks like. You uh, first set up the wallet. So this is an Ethereum-based wallet. Um, how many people in the room own Ethereum? Just by show of hands, interested. Hell yeah, that's good to see. I like that. And uh, do you guys use my Ether wallet? Just by show of hands, who uses my Ether wallet? Yeah, my Ether wallet is like the best wallet out there. Like, I use my Ether wallet. And I do use self-key at times, but uh, my Ether wallet got a DNS hack last week. It's had like numerous different problems. It like split and it's like my crypto, but also my Ether wallet. I don't really know what's going on with that project. And I'm also biased because I've got a competing product. So don't listen to everything I say about my Ether wallet. But I really do think that that's the wallet that we're trying to be better than. We have a, uh, a wallet that handles your ERC20 uh, tokens, your Ether, and it's compatible with Ledger, with Trezor. So that's kind of the base level. This is a free open source wallet. You can audit our code base, you can go check it out. We've also had professional audit done, and that's the core, but it's also my Ether wallet plus an identity wallet, right? So who here has participated in ICO? Okay, and when you did that ICO, did you have to send them your documents? Did you have to send them your passport? Yeah. So let me get this straight. So you sent a company that you didn't really know your Ether and your passport. That's interesting. I've done that as well. I feel like that's not totally safe. Um, so we're hoping to make that a little bit uh, a little bit better so that in the future you could prove, okay, I'm not American without having to reveal your Dutch passport, right? You don't really want to give this project your, your Dutch passport. That's what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, so we have the another screenshot here, my crypto and kind of the, the uh, different assets. And then you can see different products and services that are in the marketplace and then sign up. And uh, here's an alpha. This, this alpha is about six months old. We're right now in closed beta with our uh, early customer list. And uh, we're going after a few different verticals here in the beginning. Um, one of them is, I think is really cool, is residency. So you can actually apply for a residency, a permanent residency in a new country, just within the app. You can fill out the applications, you can um, pay the lawyer, you can get everything done fully online. That's the idea um, behind this, this particular uh, vertical. And then we're also going after coin exchanges. So try to make it easier to sign up for a coin exchange. So we have a few different coin exchanges that have already signed up. So basically the, the concept there is that you use your private key both for authentication as well as identification. Um, authentication is a little bit different. It's how do you prove kind of a one-to-one -one verification versus one-to-n. Um, we can get into that um, maybe on the panel or, or you can ask me a question about it. Um, here's a slide with way too much text on it. Um, what we're talking about here is what are the, what are the advantages of self-key over the existing system, right? Why do we need this, this system and what does it do for each of the parties, the identity owners, the certifiers, and the relying parties? Um, 
If you really want to know the answer to this, the best way is to, to read our white paper. Um, I slaved over that for hours, and I think like five people have ever read it. Nobody reads white papers. It's kind of sad. Um, most ICOs have white papers, which I don't even think should be called a white paper. But anyway, um, if you really want to know how this works and, and want us to prove that we don't own or control any of your data, that would be, uh, that would be the place to look. Um, so here's a very simple example of how it works in the real world, um, even with an example that we've, we've pulled off, is if you're able to do the KYC for, say, this ICO, then you basically have the green check mark, so to speak, to participate in these other ICOs. And you can share data about yourself without over-revealing that information, right? Again, like the example I gave earlier, this secondary company doesn't necessarily care about your Dutch passport number. That's not the information that they're trying to get. It's just the only technology that they have now is to be able to ask you for that document. They, but really what we need is we need to be able to share the minimal amount of information to just prove that I'm not American. Just as an example, if it's an ICO, most ICOs don't sell to Americans. That would be an important data attribute that you could share without over-revealing information about yourself. And then you could get kind of this green check mark to go into any other um, ICO and, and participate in that sale. Um, so here's kind of a chart about how long we've been working on this. Um, really 2014 kind of started in earnest and then we've gone through four different accelerators, Accenture FinTech Lab, Supercharger, um, Digital Ventures, Batch Zero, and then also Cyberport Incubator in, in Hong Kong. So a lot of the work has been done in Asia. We haven't really done much in Europe so far, but we're hoping to and we think this legislation could be good for us. Um, we have some work with banks and different uh, large institutions and then 2017 this summer we donated a code to the foundation we did our white paper and then we did our, our token sale um, and now post token sale we're really focused on um, launching the different elements of our product and just trying to get to market as quickly as possible and not be the company that doesn't release any code so our, our wallet is working you can uh, sign up for our beta test group and, and uh, use it yourself and uh, hopefully it can be, be useful to you um, so our token sale just to give some quick stats we sold uh, $21 million uh, to dollars worth of tokens. It sold out in 11 minutes. And we restricted the amount that anyone could participate to like $2,000. So we were just trying to be super conservative with the way that we did our sale. And uh, we wound up with a number that's maybe not that impressive by ICO standards. But actually, it's like a lot of money. Like ICOs raise way too much money. I don't know what all these guys are doing with like $100 million. Like probably you should have a product or a company before you raise $100 million. But anyway, um, that's that's other ICOs. We try to keep it a bit uh, less greedy, I hope. Um, here's where we're trading now. So we're trading on uh, OK Exchange, KuCoin, Gatecoin, uh, TDEX, and, and Lique. And uh, yeah, you can go and buy the key token and uh, use it within the wallet. And I hope that it benefits you. So uh, thank you all for having me. And any questions, please let me know. And happy to, happy to answer. Please. Can you get him a mic? Is it possible? Do you have a number? Or I can speak really loud. Okay, oh, speak loud. There's, yeah. there's only one mic. So, um, great story. I have a question about the auditing side. So, if the organizations that need to do their KYC need to be audited, I assume they can take the data from the blockchain, right? But the auditor company, well, the people who audit the companies, yeah, uh, do you have an application for that that speeds up this process instead of making it? Yeah, so we have Maybe, two Can you repeat the question maybe for the rest of people? Yeah, so I, short? the question, um, if, if I understand correctly, is what about the company that's receiving the information? How do they prove to regulators or auditors that we actually have collected this information, that it's uh, stored safely, that we did verify this person's identity correctly? Um, so one thing I think is really important is kind of a preliminary uh, element is that we don't store any personal identifiable information in the blockchain per se. So you could never go in and pull someone's passport from the blockchain. All that you could potentially pull, and even this is optional, is, is a hash, which is what blockchains are really good at storing. That's all that a blockchain is, is storage of hashes. But that, that hash is a really important element because it, it leads into your question, which is, how do we prove that this document was collected on this date from this person? And that hash is actually very good. A hash is, is uh, something in cryptography which is created from a one-way function. So you have a piece of data, you run a one-way function on that piece of data, and you get a resulting output. And you put that resulting output on the blockchain because you can't go backwards. It's a one-way function. So you can prove that 
this hash came from this piece of data, but you can't derive that piece of data from that hash. This is kind of the, the, the point. Um, so in the KYC world, a bank may need to collect that data. They would need to prove that they collected it from this person on this date. And for a regulated financial institution, there's no getting around that, right? But what about a fintech company that just wants to prove that you're not American, right? They may not need that actual passport. So maybe you could keep the passport attested and by the bank, that piece of data there, you might store it there. You know, we're comfortable keeping our money at banks, some of us, some of us not so much. Um, we could potentially keep a copy of our passport there and let other fintech companies maybe latch onto that attested piece of data. So I think that we, we won't see um, a complete shift where we have to stop sharing data with banks altogether. We'll still need to share data with banks, but I think if we could share less data with less companies, that would be generally a good thing, right? Because we just, right now, we share way too much data with way too many different companies, and we're asked to overshare, right? I want to prevent people from getting their identities hacked or stolen because they gave, you know, an email sign-up list their piece of data, right? That's just to me, an infringement on your basic rights as a human. And I think that that's something that we're, we're trying to work on with, with the technology that's that's uh, proven to be effective at doing so. I hope that answers your question. If, if you have a follow-up, please, please uh, Yeah, so I, I understand how the cryptography works. Uh, between the regulators and the auditors, how do you see the I mean, our system is working with banks right now. We have to share the passports. Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, the question is, um, is this accepted by regulators? Right. Um, and and uh, the answer is yes, it is. We are working with banks and, and regulated financial institutions, and the system is working now. Um, we do need to share your actual passport with that company, but we do it in a way where it's as safe as possible. We encrypt it. Um, it's stored only on that bank's servers, and it doesn't actually touch we don't even have servers. We have a serverless architecture so that we don't even touch your data. We're not even a data processor under GDPR rules. So um, it would be cooler if the regulators were able to say, hey, look, do we really need to share the scan of the passport? Like, does this really make sense? And I think that we'll get there. Sorry, I guess that's the final goal, right? That is the final goal. So, so the way that I explain it to my team is that there's this chasm, right, of where we, where we are and where we want to be. And then there's the, the death chasm in between there. And what we need to do is we need to build a bridge over that chasm. So it's compliant with existing laws and regulations today, but it's also uh, enabled by technology with where we want to go tomorrow. And we hope if we can build that bridge, then we have a nice company that you know people can use that bridge to walk over to both share the data that they need to share today by law, but also do it in a way that's future-proof and, and enables kind of the minimal data sharing in the future that's possible with this tech. Well, we can share the documents, but we can also share um, what's what's called a DID. We can share an electronic um, statement about that document with another company. So if it's, say, an ICO, the ICO is not required by law to collect the passport, like a bank is. So with an ICO, we have a little bit more wiggle room. So with them, we can share basically a JSON object that says person is Dutch residency Dutch, and you can share that element signed by HSBC Bank, and then you could share that piece of data with, with other parties, or signed by XYZ Notary. So that way, that, that secondary party can rely upon that piece of information and have only received that electronically consumable format about yourself that minimizes that data. And who's paying for it? The user, the company, both? Yeah, so it, technically the whole system is, is free, because it's a token economically driven system. The token's not free, no. So it's not free. Well, it is technically free, in my opinion, um, because you can, you don't have to pay to use the system. You just have to hold a certain amount of those tokens. And you need to hold them, but you could always sell them. So it's a bit like having a, a coupon, and then you don't actually hand the coupon over. You just keep it, and you can resell it. So we, we hope that that makes it more fair. Maybe we have time for one more? No? Okay. I'm very sorry. Later. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh,